And once again, by the way, if anybody needs uh, the uh, excused absence forms for school because of the holy days coming up, I have a bunch with me, so uh, be sure and catch me after services, and I, I have them here. Then the day I saw uh, something sort of caught my eye in the uh, in the newspaper, in the Dallas paper, I was uh, thumbing through, and there was a headline that uh, sort of caught my eye, and so I stopped and I, I read the article. It was one of these advice columns, and I don't normally read those, but uh, uh, the headline uh, got my attention. Uh, and uh, the headline had something to do with the fact that uh, the uh, um, gay Christian has questions. Well, that boy, that uh, <laughs> what, what do you mean by that? You know. So I uh, uh, read the uh, the question, and he said, uh, basically, I'm a young man, and 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 I'm a Christian, but recently I've sort of begun to wonder if I may not uh, be a, a homosexual, and that uh, has sort of uh, created some conflict in me as far as. Uh, uh, with my Christian faith, what do you think? Now, why in the world, if he had a question about Christianity, he wrote to uh, whoever this flake was in the newspaper that was writing the column, I will never know. But anyway, he wrote her and wanted to know. And her response on it, she said, look, she said, I don't see why there ought to be any conflict at all. After all, isn't what Christianity really is about, isn't it about love and kindness? Tolerance? Why should you have any conflict? Now, you know, it simply goes to, go, goes to show, to illustrate, that the world neither knows what is love nor what is Christianity. The woman who was writing the advice column, she obviously didn't have a clue. She thought she really had it figured out, though. You see, it's about love and kindness and tolerance, and so that means that whatever you want to do, we need to be kind and tolerant and loving toward you, and that's what you do is just as good as what somebody else does. And, uh, well, again, the world doesn't really understand what is love, and the world doesn't understand what is Christianity, and they don't know how to put them together. Is love simply a New Testament concept? You know, a lot of people have the idea that the God of the Old Testament was pretty harsh. He was mean and harsh and hurled thunderbolts down at people and sent floods and... Uh, you know, volcanoes and earthquakes and winds and all sorts of terrible things. And he was pretty harsh, and then Christ came along, and he was nice. And now, since then, uh, you know, the birds are singing, and the sky is blue, and everything is nice and peaceful, and, and, and we've got love now. Don't have that old law. Because, again, you, you see, you come up with a question, is love a New Testament concept or simply a New Testament concept? It is a New Testament concept. But the question is, is it also an Old Testament concept? What was the role that love played in terms of the Old Testament and the instructions of the Old Testament? And what is the relationship between love and law? What's the relationship between the love of God and the law of God? Well, I want to show you some things today. Uh, in recent sermons, we've gone through the subject of hope, and we've gone through the subject of faith. Uh, and so... You know, you stop and think about it. Well, what is the logical thing? If you're going to cover faith, hope, and love. That's, Paul said these three. Well, uh, we're going to look a little bit at this uh, third uh, area, this matter of love, from a biblical standpoint. Notice in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, we'll start... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children. So, here the instructions were, you're to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. You're to love God as totally and completely uh, as possible. Now, if we come on a little further here in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, notice we're told here, we saw in verse 7, that you're to teach these things, teach God's Word diligently to your children. Now, if you teach somebody something, you teach them diligently, sooner or later they're going to have questions. They're going to want to know, well, what, what do you mean by that? And so God anticipated that. In verse 20, 
he said, Now when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments that the Lord our God has commanded you? What's the meaning? Why do we keep all these laws? Why do we do these things? Why, do we, why are we so different from everybody around? Why do we keep the Sabbath? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? Why do we keep these laws? What's the meaning of that? Then you're to tell your son, here's the answer, verse 21. You're to explain, you're to say, We were Pharaoh's bondsmen in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Lord showed signs and wonders, great and powerful, upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore unto our fathers. And the Eternal commanded us to do all these statutes and to fear the Eternal, our God. Why? For our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. God brought us out of Egypt. And God commanded us his laws. He brought us out of Egypt, brought us into this land, gave us his laws. Why? That we might do them for our good always. So the reason why God gives his law, the reason why God gave his law was for our good. Any of you that have ever reared children, why do you give instructions to your children? Why do you tell them not to touch certain things, not to play certain places, leave certain things alone? Well, it's for their good. You know, a little kid just beginning to learn to walk. Now, number one, his eye level is quite a bit below your eye level. You know, it's about maybe where your knee is or something. Uh, so what stands out in his attention is a little different than what you notice. And the other thing is the whole world is filled with interesting things when you're a toddler. Everything. You want to explore it. And so little kid's walking, you know, he's toddling along, and he notices all these things that are on the ground because that's just about his level. You know, he sees that real well. So he sees it, and what does he want to do? He wants to experience it with all of his senses. He looks at it. He touches it. He smells at it. Then he wants to taste it. Stick it in his mouth. And you look down and you're horrified. No, 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 that's nasty, nasty. Throw that down. Don't touch that. Every parent has experienced that, right? It's, uh, and just think of the things that they got down before you noticed. <laughs> See, don't, don't ever kid yourself that you saw everything they, that started in their mouth. Uh, there were things that, that uh, got uh, past the lips and over the gums before you ever had a clue. But what you do see, you know, why do you step in? Why do you intervene? No, no, here, give me that. Don't, let, let's, let's throw that away. That's nasty. Why? For their good, always. You see, you love that child, and you want him to be healthy, and you don't want him to get sick, and you don't want him to, to hurt himself, and you don't want him to get burned on a hot stove. Uh, you don't want him to, to uh, uh, you know, get run over in the street or, or any number of things. You watch over that child, you instruct them, you, you tell them to do certain things. You know, why do you, as a parent, why do you try to guide what your child eats? You, you know, why are you concerned about what they eat? Why, you know, just give them ice cream and cake, let them live on that, you know, they'd be happy. Uh, well, if you love your child, you want them to be healthy. You want them to eat things that are going to be good for them. You want them to, you, you're concerned about them. The reason you give instructions to a child, you as a parent give instructions to a child is for their good always, if you're a loving parent. God's law is given for our good. You see, the starting point here, as we're told, has to do with love. God wants us to love him, tells us to love him with all our heart, and then he tells us that the purpose for which he gave his law is for our good always. Notice on over a little further in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God? In other words, to, to reverence him, to stand in awe of him, to walk in all his ways, and to love him 
to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you this day for your good. You see, God's law is not for our detriment. It's not to hurt us, to harm us, to uh, keep us from having any fun. God's law is for our good always. So this is explained right here in Deuteronomy chapter 10. We're told uh, in verse 14, The heaven, the heaven of heavens, is the Lord your God, the earth also, and all that therein is. Only the Lord God had a delight in your fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Circumcise, therefore, the poor skin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods, the Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regards not persons nor takes reward. So God gives us instruction. And he says, he told ancient Israel that the reason that he gave them the land that he did was because he loved them. He loved their fathers. And he made a promise to them. And that promise was based on God's love. Now, let's go back to Leviticus chapter 19. Let's look a little further. Show you something else. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 1, the Eternal spoke unto Moses, and he said, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, You shall be holy, for I, the Eternal, your God, am holy. So God said, You're to become like me. I'm holy. You are to be holy. Tell the people that they are to become like me. They are to be holy, for I'm holy. How do you teach that? How do you go about teaching holiness? Where did God tell Moses to start in instructing the people about how to become like God, how to be holy as God is holy? Verse 3, you shall fear or reverence, deeply respect every man, his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbath. I'm the eternal, your God. It's interesting, the two commandments, actually two of the ten commandments are summarized here in verse 3. And they really represent the starting point. The first commandment that a child is capable of learning is the fifth commandment. That's that's the commandment he can relate to the first. Long before you can teach him about remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, a child learns to respond and relate to his parents. That's the first people that he interacts with. And learning to love them, to honor them, to obey them, long before he could even comprehend the meaning of thou shalt not commit adultery or thou shalt not uh, kill, long before he could even comprehend the meaning of those words, he can begin to learn the fifth commandment. That's the starting point. It lays the foundation of the home, and the home lays the foundation for the rest of society because if a child doesn't learn to respect his parents at home, Why would you expect him to respect anyone or anything else? Why would he respect uh, a stranger's property? Why would he respect uh, older people or people in authority, teachers or policemen or anyone? Why would a child who hasn't grown up learning to respect his parents, why would he respect anybody else? You see, that represents a starting point if you're going to teach someone to become like God. The starting point is in the home. You should be holy, for I'm holy. First, you you learn to deeply respect your parents, and next, to keep my Sabbaths. Because just as the commandment to respect and honor our parents uh, is the starting point for all of our relationships with neighbors. See, the first neighbor you come in contact with is a little child when you're born into the world. Uh, First neighbor you come in contact with is, is mother and dad. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the starting point of your world, extending out, you know, to family and, and, and close friends. But that's the starting point, learning to relate to other people. Now, when you get to the Sabbath, why is keeping my Sabbath 
so important. Well, the Sabbath identifies the true God. You know, you can't be a Sabbath keeper and an evolutionist at the same time, because if you're an evolutionist, you have no basis for keeping the Sabbath. Because the basis that the Scripture gives us for keeping the Sabbath is that God, uh, as he told ancient Israel there at Mount Sinai, he says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And he said, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and all that in the midst, and on the seventh day he rested. He sanctified the seventh day. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, you find that God uh, rested on the seventh day, and he sanctified it. He set it apart. The basis for keeping the Sabbath holy is the fact that God made it holy, and he did so at the time of creation week. So the whole basis of keeping the Sabbath is the recognition that God is the Creator. And the Sabbath then points to creation. It's a memorial of creation, and it points to the God that we serve as the God of creation. Because, you see, if God didn't sanctify the Sabbath, if God did not make holy time as he said he did, then you're left with the conclusion that... uh, the measuring and marking of time is something that man simply evolved. He just sort of came up with the idea. And if it's simply an idea of man, well, then I guess one day is as good as another. You know, you might as well uh, throw a dart at the dartboard or something. Just pick one out. Because either God said the part and made it holy or it makes no difference at all. So God told Moses the starting point is I want you to direct people in terms of the family in terms of a healthy, proper family relationship and deep respect and honor uh, for their parents. And I want you to help them to relate to me by keeping my Sabbaths. Because every week then they will be reminded of me as the Creator. They'll be reminded of who I am. And they'll be showing respect to something that I institute. Then he instructed them about idolatry, not uh, get it, not making idols. You see, the starting point in terms of holiness, in terms of becoming like God, starts in terms of learning to show proper love and respect to neighbor and proper love and respect to God. Now, it's interesting, much of what is contained here in Leviticus 19 deals with the subject of how to love your neighbor. You know, loving your neighbor is not just sort of a nice, fluffy thought. Uh, It has practical application. Loving your neighbor is not something that simply originated in the the New Testament. We're going to see that in just a moment. Leviticus 19.9 says, When you reap the harvest of your land, don't wholly completely reap the corners of your field, neither gather the gleanings of your harvest. Why not? yours, your field. Why should you not just try to get every single grain out of the field, every single grape out of the vineyard? Why shouldn't you just go back over it and over it and with a fine-tooth comb make sure you get everything? After all, it's all yours, isn't it? Well, God says, verse 10, end of verse 10, you shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I'm the Lord your God. God says, look, I don't, I'm giving you the land and I'm giving you an inheritance. And it's yours. But I don't want you to have a selfish, self-centered attitude. It's mine. I'm going to get everything out of it. I'm going to squeeze everything I can for me. And everybody else, well, it's just tough. Well, God says, look, go through and harvest your land. Go through and harvest your crops. But, you know, what drops, what falls by the wayside, uh, what's over in the corners, just leave it there because they're poor people, they're strangers, and, and after you've harvested, they can come through and they can find something to eat. You need to be concerned about other people. You see, God's law had a very practical aspect in terms of generosity, of helping others, not being just selfish and self-centered. He went on, verse 11, he amplified again. This is all based on, on loving your neighbor. We're going to see that summed up in just a moment. He said, you shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. Okay? You don't steal. You don't rob somebody. You don't deal falsely. You don't try to cheat someone. Don't try to uh, sort of maneuver things around where you come out on top and they come out on bottom. You don't lie to others. Yeah, that's part of the way you show love towards your neighbor. Verse 13, he says, you, don't, you shall not defraud your neighbor, neither rob him. 
the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with you all night until the morning. You don't take advantage of people. You don't defraud them. See, people so often they, they look through and they say, oh, he said rob. All, all right, well, I'm not going to break in his house. That's what robbery is. Uh, I'm just going to sort of cheat him a little bit. Well, God got very specific, spelled it out. He said, I don't want you taking advantage of them. I don't want you dealing falsely. I don't want you defrauding. I don't want you robbing. In fact, when you hire somebody and you promise him a certain wage at a certain time, do it. Give it to him exactly when you promised, exactly when he's expecting it. Uh, don't try to, to take advantage of him and squeeze it out. I don't want you keeping it one extra night. You hire him by the day and tell him you'll, promise, you'll pay him at the end of the day. You pay him at the end of the day. Don't use your position of power or control uh, to put the squeeze on somebody else. Don't take advantage of someone. He went on, verse 14, You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear the Lord your God. You know, don't think it's a big joke to say something about someone or do something, uh, make fun of somebody, and, oh, they'll never know. They'll never know. You know, the idea of, of uh, uh, saying something about someone who can't hear you or, or uh, in some way ridiculing someone who, who can't see it, you think that's funny? Well, that's not showing respect and honor to them. The point is, you show respect and honor to people whether they know what you're saying and doing or not. Whether it's in their hearing or not in their hearing. Whether it's in their sight or not in their sight. It's a way of thinking about others. It's a way of dealing with others. If, uh, you, you know, people who put on a good show to your face and behind your back, they, they ridicule and they make fun and they say all sorts of things. That really reflects what their attitude is. See, God is concerned not just about outward appearance, but about attitude. He went on to say, uh, you shall not, verse 15, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. You shall not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You don't uh, show favoritism, uh, just sort of feeling sorry for somebody, and so you you tilt it their way, or uh, you're impressed with somebody and want to get in on their good side. They're wealthy, so you tilt it their way. God says if you're dealing with people, you are fair. Verse 16, You shall not go up and down as a talebearer among your people, neither shall you stand against the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall in any wise rebuke your neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. You shall not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I'm the Lord. See, that's the summary of what he's talking about here. Now, it's interesting. You know, a lot of people are familiar with the fact that Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And they think, you know, well, that's a real New Testament concept. You know, in the Old Testament, they had all these old laws. And Christ just came along, and he got rid of all the law, and he said, well, all you've got to do is love. Love God and love your neighbor. Oh, that's, that's all there is. What they don't realize is when Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God, you know, he was asked the question, what's the most important commandment? What's the most important thing in the Bible? He said, the first and great commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This is the first and great commandment. The second is likened to it. So he added one more. They didn't ask him what the second, you know, what are the first two. They said, what's the first one? So he told them what the first one was, and he said, you know, the second one uh, just goes on from that. The second is like it. The second commandment, second most important commandment, is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Everything else amplifies those two principles. Well, you see, there are those who think, well, you know, that, that's a nice thing. Jesus just came up with, with new commandments. Jesus was quoting from the Old Testament. He quoted Deuteronomy 6 and he quoted Leviticus 19. Jesus was quoting from Moses. But that's okay because Moses was quoting from Jesus when you really understand uh, who inspired these things to begin with. The point here, notice when he talks about loving your neighbor as yourself, that's not just a nice sort of thought and sort of fluffy feelings. That has to do, that's translated in practical things. God gave instructions. He said, now, one of the ways you love your neighbor is yourself, is you're generous. You, you want to help people who are, are poor, who are in need. It's interesting how God's system was set up. Uh, you know, he didn't set up a system where 
uh, the, the, uh, the poor were supposed to just sort of lay up and wait for a welfare check every month. Uh, he set up a system where they were able, they were instructed to go out and they could glean in the field. They could come after the harvester. So they had to do some work. That was good for them to get out and to, to, to look for a way to be productive until they could get on their feet. Uh, people who were in need, you can read the story in the book of Ruth and see how that worked. But God told people, he said, now look, you who, who are landowners and have a farm, be, be generous to, to people. Be, uh, you don't want to be selfish and self-centered with what you have. Be willing to share, to help. He, tell, he, he said, now don't, don't steal. Don't steal, don't rob. Not only refrain from breaking in somebody's house and stealing their property or, or uh, doing something like that, but he said, don't deal falsely. Don't, don't defraud somebody. Don't try to cheat somebody in a business deal. Don't lie to them. Misrepresent some. Oh, yeah, this thing's good as new. Never been, uh, oh, you know, just never had any trouble out of it. And all the time you're sort of hoping it'll make it out of sight, you know, before it falls apart. He said, don't deal falsely with people. Don't, don't cheat folks. Don't defraud them. Don't lie to them. He said, don't have an attitude of contempt towards someone and, and uh, you know, deal that way if you don't think they're, they can see you or hear you. Don't play favorites in terms of, of dealing unfairly with one person to, to uh, uh, you know, give special favoritism to someone else. It's interesting what's brought out in verses 16 and 17. He said, don't go up and down as a tail-bearer among the people. You know, it's interesting what's reflected here. He's, in the latter part of verse 17, he said, you shall in any wise rebuke your neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. This law is the basis of what Jesus said in Matthew 18:15. Somebody is trespassed against you, what do you do? You go to it. Go to him privately. Now, what do you not do? Well, the two things that most often people do. You know, the, the likelihood when somebody has a conflict with someone else, the two most common things for people to do is, one, go up and down as a tailbearer. You, can you believe what so-and-so did? Boy, I never would have thought he'd have done this. So they tell all their friends, get everybody uh, they know sort of agree with them as to what a bum this other guy is. Go up and down as a tail bearer. Spread gossip. Run the other guy down. Boy, he really cheated me. I, I tell you what, he's, he's a real, uh, he's a bad guy. He says, don't go up and down as a tail bearer and don't hate your brother in your heart. See, some people go up and down as tail bearers and they tell all their friends and, and, and spread rumors and, and get everybody all stirred up on their side. Others, well, I'm not going to say anything to anybody. They don't. They just nurse a grudge. They just hold a resentment. They may not talk about it. They may not go tell everybody else. They just nurse a grudge on the inside. And that resentment is there. God says, look, the two things you don't do, you have a problem with somebody, don't go and, and involve everybody else and tell all them and be a tail bearer. And don't just sit there and nurse a grudge and be mad at them. Go to them, eyeball to eyeball, face them one-on-one, -on -one, talk to them. Now, the word rebuke, if you look it up and, and understand the, the sense of it here, doesn't mean you walk up to somebody, grab him by the collar and say, well, let me tell you something. You ever do that again, boy, I'm going to fix you. That's, that's not really the way to go about it if you understand what the purpose is. Paul expounded uh, that sort of interesting right here in, in uh, uh, my margin, uh, of the, the margin printed right into the margin of, of my Bible, is the reference back to Galatians 6.1. That's where Paul explains in more detail how to rebuke your neighbor. Just turn back there. Let's notice. Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. All right, how? It says if somebody's overtaken in a fault, you see somebody with a problem, what do you do? 
He says, you which are spiritual. So the first step is, if you're going to go to somebody about a problem they've got, you better make sure first you're spiritual. That may involve that you need to spend some extra time in prayer. Maybe you even need to take a day and fast about it. He didn't say, you that are carnal, go to them and really land on them and tell them what a sorry so-and-so they are and how you'd never do such a thing. That's the opposite of what he said. He said, you that are spiritual, restore such a one. So the purpose of going to them and of confronting them is to restore them. The purpose is the restoration of that person, the restoration of a relationship, the restoration uh, of that person, because you see someone who is in serious spiritual jeopardy. You seek to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. See, you don't go to them in a holier-than-thou attitude. Boy, I don't understand how in the world anybody could ever do anything like that. I'd never do something like that. Boy, I'd never even think about something like that. You must be pretty carnal. I'm glad I'm not carnal. Uh, you, you know, can you imagine? You remember the story Christ told about the, the Pharisee and the publican that were praying? Can you imagine the Pharisee being able to, to follow this instruction in Galatians 6.1? I mean, he was the guy who was standing off over there praying, Oh, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Not like that publican over there. Oh, I'm a, I'm a good guy. I give tithes of all that I possess. I'm, uh, you, you know, I, I don't commit adultery. I don't do all these things. I, I'm really, that, Lord, I'm just about as good as you are. That's sort of the idea you get from it. He was pretty proud of himself. He says, you go to such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. I don't care whatever problem somebody has gotten entangled in. Your human nature isn't of a superior grade. You were just sort of born with a better grade of human nature, and uh, you could never be tempted to do something like they did. Under the right set of circumstances, anybody can get into just about any problem. He said, when you go to somebody, you go to them, you go in a spirit of meekness. You go with an attitude of trying to restore them. You go considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You realize you're not better than they are. You're not there to look down on them, to condemn them, but you're there to confront them and to help them. You, you know, the going to someone is, is mentioned in three different contexts. In Matthew 18 and Luke 17, Jesus addresses the subject of someone who's done something to you, someone who's trespassed against you. Galatians 6 addresses the subject of somebody who's just overtaken in a fault. They've got a problem, and you've seen the problem, and so you go to them about it. In Matthew 6, Jesus addresses something else. He said, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has aught against you, then you go. Be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. You know, that's based on the law, too. That's based on Leviticus. Uh, in the, uh, I'll show you uh, back here. Most people have no clue as the extent to what, what Jesus said was amplifying and based on the principles of the, uh, uh, of the law, of the Torah. It uh, um, goes through back here in. in uh, uh, Leviticus chapter 6. And uh, it's going through the sacrificial system and the gifts on the altar. And so it addresses the subject in Leviticus 6 too. If a soul sins and commits a trespass against the Lord and lies unto his neighbor in that which was delivered to him to keep, or he's taken something away by violence, or he's deceived his neighbor. So you've violated what it said in Leviticus 19. You cheated somebody out of something. You stole something. You defrauded them in some way. If you have committed a trespass against the Lord, understand something. Ultimately, sin is against God. If you steal from somebody, you haven't. it's not just between you and them. It's between you and God. It's also they're involved. But you have trespassed against the Lord when you cheat your neighbor. So if you sin, you trespass against the Lord, and you by cheating someone, taking advantage, lying to your neighbor, or, or uh, deceiving your neighbor. Or verse three, you found what was lost, and you lied concerning it. Say, oh no, you know that's just uh, I don't know, that's not yours. That that's that's been mine all, all along. You just maybe maybe you had one that looked like it. Uh, 
uh, you found that which was lost and you swore falsely. If you sinned, then you're guilty, verse 4. It shall be because he sinned and is guilty. He shall restore that which he took violently away or that which he deceitfully got or the lost thing that he found or what he swore falsely about. He shall restore it in the principle and add 20% to it. So he pays a penalty. He not only gives it back, but he pays a penalty and gives it to him to whom it appertains in the day of his trespass offering. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish. You see... God says, look, you can't just bring your ram. You went out and rustled somebody's cattle. Maybe you ra rustled their, uh, uh, their sheep. And so then you take one of the rams and you're going to go offer a trespass offering to God and everything will be okay. I stole a hundred sheep from this guy and I'll give one of them to God and then me and God will be square and I'll just have the 99. I'll be a good religious fellow. I'll repent of it all the while I'm selling these 99 and pocketing the money. God said, oh no. You come to offer the trespass offering to me. You not only have to give the fellow back his hundred sheep, you've got to add 20 more from, from your flock. You've got to restore him what you stole, plus you add extra to it. To compensate him for his trouble and his worry, you need to be penalized for, for having cheated him to begin with. Now, God's system was not that you paid it back to the state. You give it to the fellow that it was stolen from. Then he said, now it's still not okay because you haven't gotten square with God yet. Now you've got to come to the altar. Uh, you've got to offer your offering at the altar. You've got to, uh, your sin has to be atoned before God. But before God will accept atonement for your sin, you first got to bring forth fruits meat for repentance. If I steal your car, I can't just go tell God I'm sorry and keep your car. That wouldn't reflect being very repentant, would it? Uh, you know, somebody breaks in your house and steals your stuff, and they just sort of go and say a little prayer, Oh, Lord, uh, forgive me, and drive on down the road, and they're all happy. Everything's okay, right? No. Well, God says, you can't get square with me until you bring forth fruits for repentance. If you stole something or you cheated somebody and you're really repentant, then you want to restore to them. You want to restore that was what Jesus was quoting or paraphrasing in Matthew 6 when he says, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother has ought against you, you did something to somebody. You better go get square with him. Then come and offer your gift to God. So, when do you go to somebody? Well, if your brother's trespassed against you, you go to him. If you think that somebody has something against you, then you go to him. That's the second category. A third category is if you see a brother overtaken in a fault. You see somebody sliding down, as it were. You know, it's sort of the principle of standing on the dock and watching somebody drown. What do you do? Just sort of stand there and watch? Or do you throw them a, a life buoy or, or hold out a pole or get in a boat? Or if there's nothing else around and you can't swim, uh, then go holler for somebody and try to find somebody that can help them. But what you don't do is just stand there and just sort of be indifferent about it. That's the principle that's involved. Now, the reason people don't do that, see, the, the, the tendency, the reason God links these things together in Leviticus 19, he says, now, whatever you do, don't go up and down as a tail bearer and don't just nurse a grudge. Go to the person. But you see, most of us don't like confrontation. We don't like confrontation. So what we do is we don't want to go to the person and talk to them eyeball to eyeball and say, you know, I've got to... I've got a problem with something that you said or something that you did, or, or for that matter, uh, I think maybe you have a problem with something I did. Most people don't like confrontation, so what they do is they never go to the person. They may go to all their friends, or they may just keep it inside and let it fester and sort of nurse a resentment against somebody in their heart. Neither of those is healthy in terms of restoring relationships. And you see, when, when, we're, when he mentions in Galatians 6, restore such a one, the purpose 
of going to somebody is the restoration of a relationship. That's why it's important to go there in a spiritual frame of mind, in a humble frame of mind, realizing that you're no better than they are. Regardless of what they slipped up in and what they did, uh, under the right set of circumstances, you might do the same thing. If you want to restore them, you don't go in a haughty, uh, condemning spirit. You go in an attitude of humility. Yes, you're straightforward. But there is a spirit of humility. So, you see, the principle, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, that comes right here out of the law, right out of Leviticus 19. Not only does the Scripture tell us we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, but it goes through and it amplifies and it shows examples. How do you show love to your neighbor? Well, we've just gone through some of those things. You see, the idea that that love is simply limited to the New Testament is a very false concept. The point is that God is love. There's no one word that sums up the character and the nature of God more fully than the word love, when that word is properly understood. It's interesting that God used John to write about certain concepts. You know, John had a very special relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, that's evident as you go through the book of John. He's called the disciple whom Jesus loved. He had a very special relationship, and he also had a certain perception that really even went beyond what the rest of the twelve had. Uh, you remember the story even of the uh, after the resurrection. You remember the, some of the women had gone out to embalm the body uh, at daybreak Sunday morning. When they got out there, the tomb was empty. I mean, the first they, they saw that the stone was rolled back. The, the door was open. Then they got there, and it was empty. The body wasn't there. That's what they were looking for. Then they saw an angel. So what are you looking for the living among the dead? He's risen, just like he said. Well, they come running back, all excited. You can just imagine, you know, all the chatter and all the excitement and all of them trying to talk at the same time. And the disciples sit there, uh, you know, it's early in the morning. Maybe they're just getting up. And they uh, come here and they're banging on the door and saying, guess what, you know, he's, he's risen. Well, the disciples did what, uh, you know, men have often done. They said, Obviously, these women have gotten something all confused. We better send a couple of guys out there to find out what's really going on. So they sent Peter and John, and uh, Peter and John took off running. John records the fact I outran him. I got there first. Uh, but he got there, and he stopped. Peter came rushing on up, and he went barreling into the tomb, looked around, saw it was empty. Didn't see the angel. See, the angel had appeared to the women, but he, uh, the angel didn't appear to, to Peter and John. Peter just looked around. He saw the thing was empty. John stood there, and he looked in. And we're told that he saw and that he believed. It registered with him. The reality of what had happened really began to come through. He was the first one to really perceive what had happened. He believed. Now, Jesus appeared to the disciples later on that, that same evening. when They were gathered together for their evening meal. But John records some very important things. You ha in order to understand 1 John, you've got to read the Gospel of John and then read 1 John because the two are written in conjunction and uh, 1 John was clearly written after the Gospel of John and it uses and uh, many of the themes that were introduced. There are certain key words that are used throughout the Gospel of John and those words are repeated and used over and over in 1 John and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Now, you read those opening two verses, and then you just, if you have in mind the words of the first chapter of the Gospel of John, you see all of the, the, the themes that he picks up here in the first couple of verses of 1 John are drawn from the first chapter of the Gospel of John. John 1.1 1, 1 opens, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness comprehends it not. Now, 
John, 1 John 1, 1 opens that which was from the beginning. Well, what was from the beginning? John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. That was what was from the beginning. The Word was with God, and He was God. All things were made by Him. He was in the beginning with God. John went on to say that that which was from the beginning, we heard, we saw, we looked on Him, our hands have touched Him, the Word of life. He says, I know what I'm talking about. I heard Him, I saw Him, I touched Him. I was right there. I had an, a close, intimate relationship. And life was manifested, and we saw it. We bear witness. When I'm bearing witness, I'm bearing witness of that eternal life, verse 2 of 1 John 1, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Those are all themes that come back from John chapter 1. You see, he goes on down uh, and uh, talks about in John 1, verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, John picks up all the themes of the Gospel of John here in 1 John 1. He says, now I'm going to tell you about the one who was from the beginning. And I know what I'm talking about because I was there, I heard him, I saw him, I touched him. And I, I can tell you that. Verse 3 of 1 John 1, That which we've seen and heard declare we unto you. Why is he declaring it? That you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. So John says, the things I saw and heard, I'm declaring to you, because if you know what I know, then we have a basis of fellowship. We have a basis of, of a community. The word fellowship, uh, the word uh, in the New Testament, the same Greek word is the root for the word fellowship, the word community, the word uh, common, uh, the word uh, uh, even share or partake. All of those things come from the same word in the Greek because the, the root of the, uh, of the word means to, to share. A community shares something. We have things in common. We share it. Uh, fellowship is a sharing. So it's, it's one word. Sometimes, depending on the context, it's translated several different ways in English, but it's the same, same word. We, I want you to have this fellowship with us and with the Father and with Christ. And that will lead to joy. Now, he went on down here in verse uh, uh, 6, and he says, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not the truth. So you can't have fellowship with God and walk in darkness. He comes on a little further. Uh, in chapter 2, and verse 3, he says, Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth's not in him. Whoso keeps his word in him truly is the love of God perfected, brought to fulfillment. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that says he abides in him himself also to walk even as he walked. Now, all of these are themes that John covered in the Gospel of John. You remember in John 15 where he talked about, he quoted Jesus saying, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And he said, you've got to abide in me, and I'll abide in you. You can't bear fruit of yourself. Well, John now begins to explain that. How do you abide in Christ? Well, notice something in, in chapter 1, verse 3, he talks about that he's writing that you may have fellowship with us. And then in chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Hereby we do know that we know him. You can't know somebody if you don't have fellowship with them, can you? If you don't spend time with them, if you're not spending time together, you don't get to know him. So if we have fellowship with God, that leads to knowing God. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So you can't be having fellowship with God and really coming to know God if you're not keeping the commandments. Because if you say, I know him, and you don't keep his commandments, then you're lying. Whoever keeps his word in him truly is the love of God brought to fulfillment. 
That's the way we know that we're in him. How do you know if you're abiding in Christ? Well, if you're keeping his word. You see, you can't separate love and law. The love of God is is brought to its completion by our keeping his instructions. You know, we saw early on, back in the book of Deuteronomy, God's purpose, the reason he gave his law, he said that they may keep my, my laws, my statutes, for their good always. God's law is motivated by God's love. God loves us, and he manifest that love in several different ways. One is he gave us a law to guide us in, in paths that are good. And if we are in him, if we're abiding in him, then we have to be keeping his word. If we're abiding in him, we walk as he walked, verse 6. So you see, John ties these themes together and begins to further develop it. He says in verse 7 of chapter 2, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you've heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. Uh, John, of course, developed that theme back in the Gospel of John, where he quoted Jesus as saying, I'm the light of the world. And he talked about in John 1 how he was the true light that comes into the world. Well, the true light now shines. It's, it's really an interesting study if you go through and study the Gospel of John and the first epistle of John and you study the two of them together and you look at certain words that are repeated. John develops his thing and builds on, he tells the story in the Gospel and then he develops that theme and emphasizes certain points in the epistle. But you can't understand what he wrote in the epistle of John if you haven't read the Gospel and you're not familiar with the, uh, the themes that he developed. Now, he talks about loving God and loving our neighbor. If we say we're in the light, verse 9, whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness, even until now. He that loves his brother abides in the light. There's no occasion of stumbling in him. He that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and doesn't know where he goes because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, he talks about overcoming. You know what the key is to overcoming? Notice in verse 14. He says, I've written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. John is talking about in the first and second chapter about fellowship with God and with Christ and knowing him. If he that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar. So he's writing to people. He says, you've known him. You've known him. You, you have fellowship with him. You keep his commandments. You've known him that is from the beginning. That's the way John opened that epistle. You know, uh, he that's from the beginning, that which was from the beginning, we declare unto you. Then he went on here in verse 14. Uh, he says, I've written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Now, you can't overcome or conquer unless you are strong. What's the source of strength? Verse 14, the word of God abides in you. God's word abides in us. It's in our hearts. It's in our minds. If we we're told, you see, a few verses earlier in verse 5, that whoso keeps his word in him truly is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we're in him. We know that we're in him. We know he's in us when we're walking in harmony with his instructions. We're following his word. And that, of course, becomes then a, a, an important key to overcoming. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Wherefore, the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Can we understand the magnitude of God's love? What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? You know, John explains back in John 3, verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. 
Now, it's interesting in 1 John 3.16, he says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Isn't it interesting, some of the, uh, you know, John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16, and he makes, basically says the same thing. Just one of these little interesting uh, things, the way it's built in, sort of the pattern and the design of Scripture. This is the way we perceive the love of God. How, how do we grasp the enormity of God's love? Because he laid down his life for it. You see, God not only gave his laws for our good always, but God also made possible our redemption. Because, you see, all of us have sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. God not only gave us laws for our good, that, was, that would have been great. But, you know, if he'd just done that and sort of stood back and as soon as we messed up said, rid of him. Yep, got rid of that one. Won't have to put up with that one anymore. All of us would have been in trouble, wouldn't we? We've all been in trouble. The whole point is uh, that God took the necessary steps. Hereby, uh, you know, we're able to perceive the love of God, to grasp his love when we consider what he did to ensure our redemption, our entrance into his family what manner of love he's bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of God. His purpose is for us to be born into his family. Now, we talked about the fact earlier that a healthy family relationship has to be anchored on love and trust. Those two qualities have to be present if there's going to be a healthy relationship in a family. Love and trust. God is building a healthy family. Love is crucial ingredient. Uh, God instructs us. You know, the whole point of God's instruction deals with love toward God and love toward faith. But the marvel is not that we love God. You know, everything you and I have that's of any value has come from God. Our life comes from God. All the things, all the benefits. Uh, the point is not that we love God. The point is, the amazing thing is that God loved us. That God loved us. John says that in 1 John 4.10. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. He gave the ultimate sacrifice to pay for your sins and for mine. So God commends His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We love Him because He first loved us. You know, love, how is love learned? A little child learns to love because that little child is loved first. You can't just, you know, a little baby's born and just stand there and say, okay, you got to, you, you know, you need some love. you got to start loving. No, you pick up the baby, you love him, you cuddle him, you hold him. The child responds to love. The child learns to love because he is love. See, the starting point is God loved us. We learn to respond to God's love. We learn to love God. And then when you love God, you learn to love those that God loves. Now, you know, it's pretty easy to love God because God's pretty lovable. He's done everything for us. Now, when it comes to loving one another, that begins to get to be sometimes a of a different color, as they say, because uh, uh, we're not always real lovable, are we? Jesus said, now look, if you only love those who love you, you're no different than, than sinners, you know. Uh, everybody will do a favor for somebody that does a favor for him. Most people can be nice to somebody that's nice to them. Uh, you, you know, even people in the, in the mob may have friends with one another and do favors for one another. The point is not that we love just in a worldly carnal sense of doing a favor for somebody that does a favor for us. What God tells us to do is we've got to learn to love like he loves. We've got, and he goes through and describes that. John emphasizes that. Now, he tells us in 1 John 3.16, this is how we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. The implication of that, if we learn from that, then we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. See, if we love those whom God loves, then we look at what God has done and we say, well, I want to serve and I want to help. 
We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How do you do that in a practical sense? Well, whoso has this world's good and sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let's not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That's the real thing. It's not just talking about it, not just sort of some fluff, 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 nicey-nice, but it has to do with helping someone. It has to do with, with compassion for others. Now, he didn't say that you always give everybody everything exactly the way they want it. You know, Paul explained in 1 Thessalonians, if any will not work, neither shall he eat. He said, I hear there's some who are busybodies, not working at all, just running up and down, stirring up trouble and mooching off everybody else. And let those guys get out and get a job. That was love too. Paul wasn't, you know, mad and angry and wanted to hurt them. He knew that what they did, what they were doing, was to their detriment and it was to everybody else's detriment. And you weren't helping them uh, in in doing that. The uh, uh, comes, you see, his point here has to do with compassion. You see somebody with a need, you're in a position to help him, but you don't care. Now, the fact that you shall love your neighbors yourself that was well known. Uh, as you look at the gospel accounts, you find on one occasion somebody asked Jesus, "What's the most important thing?" He said, love, your, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. But on another occasion, you find that someone came to Jesus and asked him the same question. What's the great commandment of the law? And Jesus turned it around on that man. You read the account in Luke 10. He said, now you're a lawyer, aren't you? You're pretty familiar with the scripture. How do you read it? What do you think is most important? Well, you know, he knew the answer. He said, well... Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that's exactly right. You know, you, you do this. You really put this into practice and you'll live. Then we're told in Luke 10 that this particular fellow, and it says, willing to justify himself. Said, yes, but who's my neighbor? You see, he knew the answer academically. If you ask him on a test, what's the great, greatest commandment? Boy, he could put them down. He knew it. Knew the answers. He could quote you out of Deuteronomy 6 and out of Leviticus 19. He knew what the law said. But it was all an academic exercise. Because what he really wanted to do then was argue about the definition of neighbor. Well, it reminds me of another lawyer who wanted to argue about the definition of is. Uh, back uh, a few years ago in a deposition he was giving, you know. Uh, wanted to argue about what the word meant. Well, Jesus answered. And it's interesting how, how Jesus answered. Well, the fellow said, well, yeah, but who's my neighbor? You know, and, and, of course, the Scripture tells us his motive was he was wanting to justify himself. See, the real point of the thing was he didn't want to change. He didn't want to change what he did. Religion was something you knew. It was something that impressed other people. But he didn't want to change the way he lived and treated others. And so he wanted to argue and justify. And Jesus said, so he asked Jesus, he said, now who's really my neighbor? How do you define neighbor? Jesus said, let me tell you a little story. And let's see if we can figure out who the neighbor is. Let me tell you a little story about a fellow that went from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, got beat up, left for dead on the side of the road. Priest came by, Levite came by. Both of them saw the guy, passed on by. Then another man came by, a Samaritan. Now, Samaritans were not well thought of by the Jews at that time. So then another fellow came by, a Samaritan came by, and he looked on him and he had compassion. He was moved with compassion. And he went over there and he, he uh, gave the fellow some first aid and tried to clean him up and help him and did the best he could. And he said, now, who do you think was a neighbor? Which one of those fellows was a neighbor? Well, you know, this were, the, the lawyer was now being forced to ask, answer his own question because it started out with his question. Well, who's my neighbor? So Christ said, let me tell you a story. He told him the story. He said, now, you heard the story. Who do you think was the neighbor? Well, I guess. I, I suppose it was the fellow that helped him, that had compassion. Jesus said, that's exactly right. Go, you, and do likewise. You see, 
love must be translated into practical action. He says, if you see somebody that has a need and you're in a position to help them, and you just squelch any compassion, any concern, any uh, real thing in yourself that would cause you to help them, how can you say the love of God dwells in you? Does God just squelch his compassion? No, God gave, he laid down his life for us. He gave his only begotten son. So we learn a little bit about love. Don't love in word or tongue. Don't just talk about it, but in deed and truth. It's to be translated into reality. Well, sometimes people like to think that in some great uh, dramatic circumstance, oh, they'd lay down their life for someone. And they don't even give them the time of day in between. Why would we think we would do some great dramatic thing when we're unwilling to, in small things and in small ways, every day occurrences, day in and day out, help, and serve, show kindness? See, love involves involves a lot of things. And John tells us in 1 John 4, 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another. Love is of God. Everyone that, lo that loves is born or begotten of God and knows God. See, real, genuine love is the love of God in us. That sort of selfless concern is evidence of being a child of God, of really knowing God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. You can't know God and not know love. The two go hand in hand. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved Him, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us. His love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him and He in us because He's given us His Spirit. So, we've believed and known, verse 16, that the love that God has to us, God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God and God in Him. You can't separate love from obedience. You can't separate uh, loving God and loving your neighbor from abiding in Christ and Him abiding in you. This is how our love is brought to completion or fulfillment, verse 17, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, so are we in this world. We can approach the day of judgment with boldness because we're seeking to become like Him. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. When you really grasp the love that God has for you, there's a confidence that comes. There's a confidence. You know, a little child has such a confidence in his parents. You, you just, you know, you can toss them up in the air and more they'll just uh, giggle and shout and, and, and uh, just be happy. Uh, there, there's, there's a confidence that they have. There's a confidence. And, you know, a little kid gets hurt and falls down, scrapes his knee, whatever. Well, what does he want? Is he hollering for the doctor? No, he wants mama. He wants her to kiss it and make it well. There's a confidence, you see, when when your parents had it. There's a confidence that comes. That confidence comes because you know they love you. And you have confidence in their love, and you've got confidence in, in their love. That casts out the fear. That's the whole point. You see, there is a confidence in our relationship with God when you really perceive the love that God has for us. We love Him because He first loved us. Verse 19. But if a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. If you don't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you haven't seen? This commandment have we from him that he who loves God love his brother also. You see, the two go hand in hand. When Christ said on these two principles, hang all the law and the prophets, everything else amplifies and explains to us how to show love toward God, how to show love toward neighbors. You know, Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. You know, you and I need to ask ourselves the question, if we were on trial in court, 
you were on trial in court, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Let's, let's close back here in what is called the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. The Apostle Paul was writing to a church that had its problems and its difficulties. And people were jealous and they were trying to get one up on one another and they were uh, wanting to uh, be spiritually impressive, you know, impress others. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, I'm a sounding brass or tinkling sound. I'm just making noise. doesn't matter if I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries, all knowledge, have all faith so that I could move mountains and have not love. I'm nothing. He didn't say I'm, I'm a third of the way there or two-thirds of the way there or half the way there. He said I'm nothing. I'm, I'm zero. I'm nothing. You can understand every detail. You, boy, you could know uh, all of the, the the intricate details of every technical point of the Bible. What about if you serve? You give everything you have, or you're even willing to suffer martyrdom? If you don't do it for the right reason, it doesn't profit anything. If you don't have love, it profits nothing. Love is is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous, it's not boastful, it's not arrogant, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not irritable. Love doesn't keep a tally on evil. You know, sort of like an accountant, you got your, your ledger book, and boy, you know, okay, he did this to me, okay, he did that to me. Uh, love doesn't keep an account of evil. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, never collapses. You know, everything else comes to a conclusion. Everything else, you know, prophecies ultimately are all going to be fulfilled. Eventually, there'll be no more prophecy. It'll all be history. We will have lived it. We will have experienced it. Everything has its conclusion except love. Love goes on into eternity. That is a basis of our relationship with God, our relationship with one another in the family of God. Love and trust. Trusting God. Trusting the Father. You know, now, everything we have is partial. But ultimately, we're going to be there. We're Right now, it's sort of like looking, you know, in a... Uh, a mirror, the, the kind of mirrors that were common in that day were made generally out of brass. Uh, they were polished brass, and there was a certain amount of distortion in there. You could see the reflection, but it was, uh, you know, a little bit distorted in terms of uh, color or terms of uh, uh, just even just the distortion of the mirror. But he said, then we'll see face to face. You know, now our knowledge, no matter how well you think you know God, that knowledge isn't perfect. But then... We'll see him face to face. Now I know in part, then I'll know even as I'm known. Now abides faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest 